Take your Bible this morning for our scripture reading, if you would, please, to the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, please, Philippians chapter 2. We're going to read verses 9 through 11, <clears throat> Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. They're not lengthy, so let's just read it all in unison together this morning, verses 9, 10, and 11, Philippians chapter 2. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. And let's begin together on verse 9 of Philippians chapter 2. Ready? Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing now to the reading of the scripture this morning, and thank you, Lord, for the wonderful singing of the people of God today, and Lord, our, our hearts have been blessed, and Lord, we're, we're so grateful and thankful for your goodness to us. We love you this morning. We pray your blessing on the special now as it's sung, that we'll listen carefully to the message of this song, and you'll continue to prepare our hearts that we'll be ready to receive the truth from your word this morning, and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Go with me back to where I started from, and I know you would see the miracle of love that took me in its sweet embrace and made me what I am today, a sinner saved my grace. I'm just a sinner. life I take a loved and forgiven I'm back with the living I'm just a sinner saved by grace how could I boast of anything I've ever seen or done how could I dare to claim as mine the victories God has won where would I be had God not brought me gently to this place I'm here to say I'm nothing but a sinner saved by grace. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. When I stood condemned to death, he took my place. And now I grow and breathe in freedom with his breath. Of life I take, a loved and forgiven, I'm back with the little loved and forgiven, I'm back with the living, I'm just a sinner, saved by grace, and now I grow and breathe. 
living breath of life I take, loved and forgiven, back with the living. I'm just a sinner, sinner. Father in heaven, we bow before you now in prayer. We come to open up your word this morning. And Lord, I pray that you'd help each of us to give you our undivided attention. Lord, we would have the utmost respect for the only book you've ever written. And I would ask you again that the word of God would be quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And that Holy Spirit of God, you would minister the word of God to each and every heart that's here this morning. And I pray that the name of Jesus would be lifted up here today. And as his name is lifted up, you'll draw all men unto him. Help us today. For Jesus' sake, amen. Oh, years ago, when... The golfer Tiger Woods had his marital problems and affairs came to light. To the extent to which he, Tiger, can recover, it seems to me depends on his faith. He's said to be a Buddhist, but I don't think that faith offers the kind of forgiveness and redemption that is offered by the Christian faith. So my message to Tiger would be, Tiger... Turn to the Christian faith, and you can make a total recovery and be a great example to the world, end quote. Well, he got a firestorm of criticism for those remarks, for seemingly, in people's eyes, wanting to disparage someone else's religion. But the truth is, the problem is that name, Jesus. Something about that name. It's the only name that people take in vain. It's the only name that people take in vain. The only name people swear by. The only name that stirs up hate and venom. No one says what in Allah's name is going on. No one texts OMB. For oh my Buddha. It just simply proves that there's truth in Christianity. That other things are false. Because it's only the name of Jesus that has the punch, the power behind it to matter. Now listen, the truth hurts and the truth helps. But the truth is never neutral. No one ever tells an enemy to go to purgatory. There's no jab in that because there's no truth in a non-existent place. No, they tell their enemy to go to hell, a place that they supposedly don't even believe in. But that carries the punch. The Bible tells us here in Philippians 2 and verse 10 that at the name Of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth. For 2,000 years now, that name of Jesus has not just reformed alcoholics, but transformed them. Has not just, it, it it has purified prostitutes, it has made liars tell the truth, it's turned haters into lovers. It's made, turned whoremongers into faithful people. It's cleaned up cursing mouths. It's made, turned whoremongers into faithful people. It's cleaned up cursing mouths. And it has saved souls from hell. The name of Jesus. Ever heard someone say that name and it's obvious they aren't honoring him by saying it? You ever called a person down? Who does that? 
I have. If someone spoke my mother's name in disgust like that, I would certainly defend her. I'll certainly defend my Lord. That name of the Lord is sacred. It's a holy name. It's at that name that angels bow down. It's at that name that the demons tremble. It's at that name that Satan has to flee. The name of Jesus. Names in the Bible are rather significant that. And they uh, name them after mom or dad or grandma or grandpa or aunt or uncle or somebody. And they name you that way. But in the Bible, in fact, you, you associate certain things with names in the Bible. I could say Judas. And what do you think of? Yeah. Judas scared or Judas the traitor? Thomas? The doubter. Isn't that something? And, and we, we understand that. And, and even in our day, you could think of, if I said the name Hitler, <laughs> yeah, all kinds of things come to your mind, but none of them good. George Washington. Yeah. yeah. Maybe the founding father or honesty. Someone said the name Musk may open doors of finance and Einstein may open doors of brilliance and Michelangelo may open doors of art, but the name of Jesus will open the doors of finance and Einstein may open doors of brilliance and Michelangelo may open doors of art, but the name of Jesus will open the doors of heaven to you. We honor the name of military generals. We honor sometimes the names of spiritual leaders. We honor sometimes athletes, but how much more should we honor the name of our Lord? Amen. Psalm 8 and verse 1, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Psalm 25, 11, for thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. Psalm 111, verse 9, holy and reverend is his name. That's why I don't, I don't go by Reverend Slabaugh because holy and reverend is his name. I'm not reverend. And that's that, not me. So we need to remind it. I'll remind you the mindset of the Orthodox Jew in the Bible days concerning the name of God. The scribes as they would um, copy the Bible. Anytime they, they came to the name of God, they'd rise from their work table. They would go and wash themselves, change their clothes, come back, pick up a brand new quill, never used before, and write the name of God. And they did that every time they came to his name. Sometimes as often as three times in a single verse. Why would they do that? That takes so much time. No, that's how much respect they had for the name of God. Boy, we've come a long way, haven't we? There's many, there's many, many Old Testament names for God, but when God became flesh, when God said, I'm going to come to earth, He chose one name, and He chose the name of Jesus. You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus. There's just something about that name. Someone said Jesus is the veracity of truth, the verity of love, the victory of grace, and the visibility of God. It is honey to the taste, harmony to the ear, and healing to the soul. And yet... I think we live today in the most cursing generation in the history of mankind. Vile words are now said that are uttered in public. Sad that many Christians, even professing Christians, don't think about using curse words or the name of God in a frivolous way. Some think because they throw a swear word in, they're 
putting emphasis to their argument. I say if your argument's so weak that you need to add a swear word to it, you need to go back and revisit your argument. It's not very strong. Remember when cursing used to be considered a, you know, a man language and, and they would say, watch your mouth, there's a lady present. That's not even an issue anymore. I used to, when I worked in a shop, I used to, when I worked in a shop, had a one foreman that was a very foul-mouthed guy. And, and I remember making a sign-up on the computer, and it was, profanity is the strongest expression of a weak mind. And somehow that found its way to his office door. And uh, I walked by a while later, and it was tore off. The piece of tape and about that much paper was left there. But amazingly enough, another one showed up, and uh, trying to help him understand that a cursing isn't the way to get your point across. I want to share with you a couple of things about cursing, and I'll j- just by way of introduction, because you know, sadly, Christians have fallen into this trap. I, I suppose. And you think, wait a minute. Something not right here. When you curse, you reveal four things. Number one, you reveal a lack of character. Because the Bible says it's out of the abundance of the heart that our mouth speaks. And so, like the old country preacher said, what's down in the well comes up in the bucket. <laughs> and so, uh, what, what's in our heart is what comes out. You can tell what a person is by what they say. We followed you around for a week and just recorded your words. We could tell what's in your heart. An old preacher of yesteryear, Sam Jones, said, When I get around a man who swears, I watch my pocketbook. For a man who swears would surely steal. So it shows a lack of character. Swearing shows a lack of intelligence. As I said, As I said, when you have to use profanity to try to get across your point, you've got a pretty weak point. Someone else said profanity is the attempt of a feeble mind to express itself forcibly. No place for it. Lack of intelligence. Lack of character. A lack of understanding. You ever think about how foolish it is when people use curse words? What does it get you? I mean, I, I'm not advocating stealing, but at least when you steal something, you get something for it. When you curse, you don't get anything. I mean, you have a flat tire, and so you, you, you curse. Well, did that put air in the tire? Did that change it for you? Let's say take the hot air you used to curse and put it in the tire, maybe. You know, you cursing doesn't unstub your toe, and cursing doesn't move your golf Cursing doesn't unstub your toe, and cursing doesn't move your golf ball from the rough to the fairway. I don't know that for sure, but Dr. Yoder told me it's true. (laughs) Now, the only thing you earn by cursing is the judgment of God. The Lord will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. Don't don't take God's name in vain and then say, oh, I didn't mean that. Or oops. Don't when you say I didn't mean it, are you saying God's name is meaningless to me? I can use his name and not even mean it. Because that's what vain means. Vain means empty or meaningless. It's a lack of reverence for God. And don't don't listen, I'm trying to help you now, okay? Christian euphemisms. For swearing. Uh, I, don't, I don't use the word gosh. Oh my gosh. That's so easy for someone to interpret that as taking the Lord's name in vain. I don't say gosh darn it. That's a little too close to saying the wrong thing. I'm just, I just cleaned it up for a Christian version. 
That's not right. Again, God knows our heart. So I want to talk to you of just a few minutes this morning. That's just the introduction, okay? We're, we're in the message now. Aren't you glad we got through that? There have been names that I have loved to hear. But never has there been a name so dear to this heart of mine as that name divine, the matchless, matchless, matchless name of Jesus. There's nothing like that. It's a comforting name. In fact, Jesus here in, in Philippians, Paul says it's a name that's above every name. Peter would announce in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, he said, And being unto you and all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. It's only in the name of Jesus that this man is made whole. It's only, he goes on to say in verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The name of Jesus. I don't know what the needs are in your life today, but I know this. The songwriter said, take the name of Jesus with you. Child of sorrow and of woe, it will joy and comfort give you. Take it then where you go. I've been in the hospital and watched the mother of a suffering child find hope in the name of Jesus. I've stood at the bedside of some dying saints and seen them take comfort and hope in the name of Jesus. Just hearing the name Jesus read to them from the scriptures. Charles Wesley wrote in his song, Jesus, the name that calms my fears, that bids my sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears. Tis life and health and peace. Jesus is a comforting name. Jesus is a strengthening name. It says that the name of Jesus every knee shall. Jesus is a comforting name. Jesus is a strengthening name. It says that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. He said uh, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Did you know there's power in that name? At his name, the demons will flee. By his name, prayers are answered. At his name, angels stand by to do his bidding. At his, in his name, kingdoms have been built. Armies have been destroyed. In the name of Jesus, the winds and the waves have obeyed that voice. They're subject to him. At the name of Jesus, sins can be forgiven. Not just forgiven, but removed, as they sang this morning, gone. Gone, 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 enough for me. Praise God, my sins are gone. So are you. Jesus is the only one who can do that. He's the only one who can forgive your sin. There's power in that name. There's power in that name. Because of that name of Jesus, do you understand one day the Bible says the trump's going to sound? We sang it this morning. Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. The Bible says the trump of God's going to sound. Jesus is going to descend. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. And we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Why? Because of the name of Jesus. There's power in that name. There's power in the name of Jesus and we'll be reunited with loved ones who's gone on before. And, and the Bible says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? O grave, where is thy victory? Even death and the grave are subject to the power of Jesus' name. That's why we sing, All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. There's comfort in that name and there's power and strength in that name. There's respect in that name. 
God has highly exalted him. There are many great names in history. Whether we think of Washington, as we mentioned earlier, or Lincoln, or in, in preacher's realm, a Charles Spurgeon, or others who we mention. But I'm going to tell you, nobody compares to Jesus. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea of Philippi, he asked his disciples, whom, disciples, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, well, some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's Jesus. To the artist, he's the altogether lovely one. To the architect, he's the chief cornerstone. To the astronaut, he's the son of righteousness. To the baker, he's the living bread. To the banker, he's the hidden treasure. To the biologist, he is the life. To the carpenter, he's the sure foundation. To the doctor, he's the great physician. To the educator, he's the great teacher. To the farmer, he's the sower and the lord of the harvest. To the florist, he's the lily of the valley and the rose of Sharon. To the geologist, he's the rock of ages. To the horticulturist, he's the true vine. To the judge, he's the great price. To the editor, he's good tidings of great joy. To the occult, to occultist, oculist, he's the light of the eyes. To the philosopher, he's the wisdom of God. To the printer, he's the true type. To the servant, he's the good master. To the student, he's incarnate truth. To the toiler, he's the giver of rest. And to the sinner, he's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And to the Christian, he's the Son of the living God. He's my Savior, he's my Redeemer, and he's my Lord. Oh, he's everything. I, I respect the name of Jesus. There's comfort in that name. There's strength in that name. There's respect in that name. There's salvation in that name. Do you notice it says every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I mentioned it earlier that neither is there salvation in any Lord. I mentioned it earlier that neither is there salvation in any other. Say, well, pastor, what about all those Buddhists? What about all the Muslims? What about all the Hindus? Are you saying that they'll die and go to hell? No. God says that. I didn't say that. God said that. I'm just telling you what God says. You say, well, that's awful narrow. Jesus said, straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. He said that's the way it would be. Broad is the way, wide is the gate that leads to destruction. Many there be that go in there at. It's a narrow road. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not a way, not one of the many ways. I'm the way. Neither is there salvation in any other. She'll bring forth a son, and you'll call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. But as many as received him, Jesus, to them gave he power. To become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The only way you get your sins forgiven, because listen, Jesus is the one who paid the price for your sin. No one else has ever done that. Why did Jesus come? He came to live a sinless life. No one's ever done that. The Bible says he came and he was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. So Jesus was the only one who ever lived perfect. He never did anything he shouldn't have done, never said something he shouldn't have said, never thought anything he shouldn't have thought. Why? Because the Bible says the thought of foolishness is the thought of foolishness is sin. Jesus never sinned. He was perfect. But the Bible says the wages of sin is what? Yeah. Death. Well, did Jesus die? Yes, he did. Well, wait a minute. How come he was paying the wages of sin if he didn't have any? Because he wasn't paying for his sins. Whose sins was he paying for? You're exactly right. Our sins. All our iniquity on him was laid. 
he nailed it all to the tree. Jesus took every sin that you've ever committed and even sins you haven't committed yet, but he knows you will. And he laid those sins on himself and he said, God, punish me instead of Stan Slayball. God, punish me instead of Kurt Bailey. God, punish me instead of Jeff Walters. He took our place. The agony and the pain and the torment he went through on the cross, that's what we would have went through in hell. Jesus suffered it for us. That's why he cried out on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God, at that moment, with the, uh, the sins, and by the way, at that moment, darkness upon the face of the earth for three hours. Has Jesus Christ paid for our sins? How can you tell me someone else can give me salvation? How can you tell me I can be good enough to go to heaven? Why did, God do, why did Jesus do that then? Are you saying all that didn't matter? All that is nothing? They took him down from that cross and they put him in the borrowed tomb. And for three days and three nights it looked bleak. But again... There's power in that name. And three days later, God, his son from the dead, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain. And he lives forever with his saints to reign. Jesus Christ is alive. That's how he can save you. A dead person can't save anybody. He's alive. He rose from the dead. He showed himself alive to over 500 people. Forty days later, he ascended back up to heaven where the Bible says he sits at the right hand of God. And he's waiting to that return that we spoke about earlier when the trump will sound and God will say, go get your bride. Amen. And in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, all those who believe in Jesus Christ and trust him as their Savior in just that quick, quicker, we'll be gone. We'll be gone. It'll make the headlines, buddy. It'll be all over the news. And you, and you don't have to wonder if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ your Savior. You won't have to wonder what happened. You'll know. You'll remember that, that day you were in church and that preacher talked about that happening. You'll say, this is what he was talking about. And you'll be left behind for a time that this world's never seen. Never seen the likes of. My friend, don't do that. Take the gift of salvation. That's why God said the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Eternal life is a gift. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. It's a gift. It's a gift because someone else has already worked for it. Someone else has already paid for it. And that someone else was Jesus Christ. And so now God says it's a gift. You just have to accept what Jesus has done for you. And when you trust him alone and what he's done for you, I give you the gift of eternal life. And you will never perish. That's what he said. I give unto them eternal life and they will never perish. Boy, I'm glad there's salvation in the name of Jesus. Amen. And then let me end with this. It's a worthy name. It's a worthy name. Every knee shall bow. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. The apostles thought it was a worthy name to suffer for. In Acts 5 and verse 40 it says, And to him they agreed, and when they called the apostles and beaten them. In Acts 5 and verse 40 it says, And to him they agreed, and when they called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. We haven't come to that yet in America, but we'll, we're coming there. Where we may have to suffer some for his name's sake. Because we carry the name Christian. We carry the name Christ-like one. They thought it was a worthy name to suffer for. In fact, it's a worthy name to die for. Paul said this, Acts 21, 13. Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and break my heart? I'm ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. 
Paul said, I'm, I'm going to glorify God. What I for Christ? And we're not there yet. Though there are Christians in this world that are facing those decisions. We don't hear about it. It doesn't get reported in our news. But it's happening in the world. We're not there yet. But I tell you what the Lord wants. It's a name not just to die for. It's a name to live for. That's where we are. Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Oh, my friend, whatever we do, let's live for Him. That name, the name of Jesus. There's nothing like that name. There's nothing like the name of Jesus. There's so much in that name. There's comfort. There's strength. There's power. There's respect. There's salvation. There's salvation. There's worthiness. All in the name of Jesus. I want to sacrifice for him. I want to stand up for him. I want to speak up for him. I want to, I want to sing about him. I want everybody, everybody ought to know, everybody ought to know, everybody ought to know who Jesus is. There have been names that I have loved to hear, but never has there been a name so dear to this heart of mine as the name divine. The matchless, matchless name of Jesus. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. And he's just the same as his name. And that's the reason why I love him so. For Jesus is the sweetest name I know there's something about that name let's pray together shall we father take the truth this morning thank you for Jesus thank you Jesus for loving us thank you for being willing to come and lay down your life as a sacrifice for our sin thank you Jesus that once we receive you as our savior you never leave us nor forsake us Forgive us when we think more of us than we do you. Forgive us when we think more about us and we look more to us than we do to you. Oh, I pray we'd lift up the name. Oh, I pray we'd lift up the name of Jesus. That we'd bow to that name of Jesus. I pray each one of us this morning there's some who need to find comfort in that name today. There's some who need strength in that name today. We all need to respect that name today. And Lord, there's some who may need to find salvation in that name today. But all of us would say that is a worthy name to suffer for, to die for, and to live for. May Jesus Christ be precious to us today. Heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I'm going to finish praying in just a moment. I wonder how many folks here today would say, Pastor, I have found that there is salvation in the name of Jesus. One day I heard and I knew and from the Bible that I was a sinner and I needed a Savior. And I discovered just what you said this morning, Pastor, that Jesus came and lived a perfect life on this earth and yet he took my sins on himself and he died for me. He died in my place. He was my substitute. And I called on Jesus and I asked him to save me. And Pastor, when you said there's salvation in that name, I can testify, I know that's true because I've trusted him as my Savior. And if that's your testimony today, slip your hand up right now. Would you do that and say, that's me, Pastor. I know that I'm saved. There's no doubt in my mind. All right, you may put it down. Are you here today and would say, Pastor, I don't know that for sure. I can't say for certain that if I die, I'd go to heaven. 
Pastor, I pray stand up right now and say, pray for me, Pastor. Just put it up and put it back down. I don't know that I've ever trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. All right. Is there something about that name, Christian? Are you here today and would say, you know, I, I just needed the reminder today, Pastor, about the, the power, the strength, the comfort, the worthiness is in that name of Jesus. He'll change your life if you'll look to him and rely upon him and be aware of him. Look to him every day. I wonder how many believers here this morning say, Preacher, God spoke to my heart today through the message. Pray for me this morning. Will you slip your hand up, Christian? Yes. Praise the Lord. God bless you. You may put them down. Wonderful. You know, in Hebrew, praise the Lord. God bless you. You may put them down. Wonderful. You know, in Hebrews, the Bible says we run the race. We have a cloud of witnesses. Those believers who've gone on before us. But the Bible says as we run the race, we're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Can I encourage you today that as you live your Christian life, keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on him. He'll never let you down. He'll never fail you. In a moment, I'll pray, and then we'll have our invitation. When I'm done praying, we'll stand to our feet. The pianist will begin to play. Brother Bob will sing a hymn of invitation. If you're here today and just want to come and kneel at the altar and talk to the Lord Jesus for a few minutes before you go home, the altar is open. If you're here today and you're saved and you've never been scripturally baptized and you say, you know, I, I need to obey the Lord and be baptized today, then you come. If you're saved and you're scripturally baptized, then you come and we'd be glad to welcome you into the fellowship of our church. Whatever it is that God's dealt with your heart about, just obey him this morning. Heavenly Father, have your will and way now in this invitation time. I pray, God, that you'll help each of us to do what you're bidding us to do in our heart, that you'll meet with us now in these next few moments. Thank you for speaking to our hearts this morning.